Okay, well, uh, for those that don't know me, yeah, I'm, Julie, I'm Nicola Walbank from Julian Taylor Solicitors. We're a specialist employment law practice based in Western on the Green. Um, so we advise employers and employees on a whole range of topics to do with the world of work. Thanks ever so much for tuning in today. I thought we'd use this session to uh, just take a look at a number of recent and forthcoming changes in employment law. Businesses have really understandably been pretty occupied with dealing with COVID-19 and the issues that that's thrown up, furlough and ensuring the well-being of staff as we've all adjusted to a completely different world of work. But there are other things that have been going on and so I thought we would look at those today. So this is going to be a bit of a, a COVID-free zone. I thought I would start by taking a look at uh, some of the key changes that we saw in 2020. And first, um, in relation to the changes to Section 1 statements of terms and conditions. So since the 6th of April 2020, written uh, employers have been required to provide employees and workers with a written statement of particulars of employment, often referred to as a Section 1 statement. Before April last year, there was already a very long-standing statutory obligation on employers to provide employees with a written statement of particulars. And employers traditionally have done that by providing a contract, including the relevant details. So it's nothing new, really, it just some tweaks to that obligation. And the new rules change the requirements in a number of ways. Uh, firstly, written statements now need to be provided to workers as well as employees. So it's a broader category of individuals that are now entitled to a section one statement. Workers is a wider category, those that have contracted with a business to personally do work uh, where they're not running their own business. We've also uh, had a change in that it's now a day one right. From the 6th of April 2020, uh, workers and employees are entitled to the statement um, on or before their start date. It used to be something that you could leave for up to a month. And whilst it's always been advisable to give it right from the off, uh, it's now a legal requirement. It's also a change to the amount of information that's to be provided. More information now needs to be given. I'm not going to run through exactly uh, the, the nitty gritty of the detail of what needs to be provided when, but I have put a link to uh, the ACAS code um, the, the ACAS guidance on this, which sets out what needs to be provided in a single document and where you can refer off to a separate document for some of these things. But importantly, I think it is worth just noting that uh, certain areas do need some more information. So now uh, the different forms of paid leave that you provide need to be spelt out. You also need to provide uh, details of benefits including non-contractual benefits rather importantly and also more information about training now it needs to be given. Doesn't mean that you need to go back and change all of your old contracts, but do just be aware that if somebody, an existing former, uh, an existing employee who's, who's been with you since before these changes makes a request for an updated statement, then they're entitled to have one and you should give that within a month. Um, there's, uh, and I think it's, it, it, it's true to say that, you know, many employers will have these changes well and truly under their belts. Um, and, that, and that's great, but we are still seeing quite a lot of contracts being issued that don't make, meet these new requirements. Business owners have understandably had a busy year. As I said, we've been thinking about other, other things, but this is really an easy one to get right. And employers that are a bit behind should take a look at their documentation now, review and update their templates. Um, and I think consider as well if you've got workers who perhaps haven't been having statements up to now, but may need a special worker agreement that ticks the statutory boxes. Big question, so what, what if we just don't bother? Well, um, employees and workers can't bring a, a freestanding claim for compensation for a failure to provide a written statement, but if an employee or a worker has a separate claim, for example, a claim for discrimination or uh, an, a deduction from wages or unfair dismissal, and they successfully bring that claim in the tribunal, then they can tack on an extra claim for failure to provide a written statement um, and can be awarded an additional two to four weeks pay, uh, subject to a statutory cap of £538 per week. 
So the penalty for breaching this requirement is quite small. The financial penalty is quite small in the grand scheme of things, although it could tot up if you've got a big workforce or lots of pending claims. Uh, so I, I think aside from the financial penalty, uh, another key point for getting this sorted is, is that um, you know, contracts and documentation are often some of the first things your new recruits see about your business. So presenting clear, legally compliant documentation really does set a good tone at the start of an employment relationship. Uh, I think as well it's also just worth noting um, that where you now need to include details of benefits in your section one statements you want to make sure that you're preserving the non-contractual status of anything that you don't want to legally commit to. Taking care about how you document things like uh, bonuses um, or insurance protections that you offer, you know, private medical or permanent health insurance, etc., is really important in how you word those things. And that's something that, that we have been supporting employers with. I'm now going to move on to some of the other changes that we saw last year, um, just as a bit of a recap. Firstly, and quite rightly, uh, we saw the introduction of parental bereavement leave. So from 6th of April 2020, there is a right to two weeks parental bereavement leave for working parents. It's a day one right. You don't have to have been employed for any particular period in order to have the right to parental bereavement leave. Um, although it's only paid at the statutory rate if you have 26 weeks of service. And the rate is there on my slides, um, uh, the lower of the statutory rate or 90% of normal weekly earnings. Although, of course, lots of employers will enhance bereavement pay, um, either to extend it to uh, all employees, regardless of length of service, or to just top up the statutory rate and that's a decision for a business to make. We also saw some changes to the taxation on termination payments. Um, so on the 6th of April 2020 national insurance position on termination payments to employees was changed. Historically termination payments and when I say termination payments I mean sums paid to employees on the termination of their employment uh, were generally exempt for employer NICs. Um, but since the 6th of April 2020, uh, any amounts over 30K are now subject to Class 1A national employer national insurance contributions um, as well as income tax. So that really significantly increases the cost to an employer of making a termination payment of over that 30K threshold uh, by 13.8% on the excess. So that's really an important thing to consider and factor in to your calculations and sums if you are contemplating making termination payments. Uh, the last change for 2020 that I just wanted to uh, recap on is something that came in at the start of December 2020. So this is a, a more recent change and that's changes to the early conciliation process. As you may be aware, uh, before a claimant can bring proceedings in the employment tribunal, uh, many types of claims first need to be notified to ACAS by the claimant, and that triggers uh, an ACAS early conciliation period to be completed before the individual can then go ahead and actually issue proceedings in the tribunal. And that was traditionally a one month period where the parties did have the scope to agree a two week extension, but that's been extended to a default six week period at the start of December 2020 with the aim of giving ACAS and the parties more time to seek to resolve their dispute before it escalates to the tribunal. I now just want to turn to 2021 and some of the changes that we have seen and can expect to see this year and also beyond. Firstly, um, I want to talk about Brexit, um, as I think there's been quite a lot of speculation and you may have seen uh, stuff in the press about uh, how Brexit is going to impact on employment law. So I thought we'd talk about that. Much of our, uh, much, much of our employment law has traditionally been derived from employment law. And the starting point is that these European laws 
um, have been incorporated into domestic legislation and so become part of our UK law. And so Brexit doesn't mean that we suddenly leave all of that behind us, it's still our law. Um, but of course, domestic law is amendable. And so we now theoretically have, have bigger freedoms to amend those laws going forward. So the big question is, well, what does the government plan to do? Um, in early January, uh, there, it was reported in the FT um, that there was a planned review of workers' rights. And there was quite a lot of, of uh, controversy and, and, and hype around what that might look like. However, towards the end of January, the Secretary of State uh, for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy confirmed a U-turn and stated that there is no government plan to reduce workers' rights. So it appears that for the time being, there just isn't a political appetite to start adjusting employment protections. Uh, I should also say that the UK's trade agreement with the EU contains commitments that the parties won't weaken or reduce labour protections below the levels in place at the end of December 2020. So doing so, fiddling with uh, employment laws could end up having implications for our trade arrangements. So therefore, we, we just don't expect any uh, particular immediate change. But having said that, that could shift now or in the future, depending upon the government of the day and the appetite to, uh, to, 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 to change things. So I think it's one of, you know, there isn't going to be any, any major immediate change, but watch this space. I have just flagged in the slides um, working time limits, the 48 hour working time limit, and also uh, overtime being included as part of holiday. They are some of the more controversial European provisions that I think are probably the first things that could be tinkered with um, as and when we get to that point. But, but yeah, no key change for now. I'm now going to move on to talk about um, IR35 and reforms to the off payroll working rules. This is a legislative change that is about to make uh, an imminent impact and is uh, a significant one. Before I launch into what's changing, I thought it would be helpful to just recap on the background. IR35 was introduced to tackle the situation where individuals were potentially avoiding paying income tax and national insurance contributions by supplying their services via an intermediary company and instead paying themselves dividends from that intermediary company. And IR35 requires the intermediary, often a personal service company, to make a determination on whether the worker would be deemed to be an employee of the end user but for the presence of the intermediary. So does it look like disguised employment? And if so, then the intermediary business has to operate payroll and make deductions for income tax and NICs on the sums received for services. Just to add a little bit of, of sort of colour to that then, if you have um, an individual, let's call her Anne Jones, she uh, supplies, her, she set up her own business, Anne Jones Limited, which is her personal service company. And then that company contracts with an end user business to supply the services of Anne herself to that business to perform consultancy services. So in that situation, you've got Anne the individual, Anne, Limited, Anne Jones Limited, the intermediary business, and then the company that her business um, supplies services to. And uh, what IR35 means is that her business needs to look at the relationship between Anne and the end user business. And if that looks like disguised employment, if the relationship but for the existence of her intermediary company would be an employment relationship, then her business needs to operate payroll and make deductions for income tax. So that's how things work at the moment. In 2012, the rules were changed in the public sector. And what that looked like was that the burden shifted from the intermediary, from the Ann Jones Limited company, to the end user who then had to make a status determination and if appropriate, operate payroll itself on the sums that it was paying out. And uh, what we're now seeing is uh, these changes being extended to cover large and medium sized businesses in the private sector. And this was originally planned for April 2020, but got put off 
due to the pandemic. And now these rules are taking effect from the 6th of April 2021. So significantly from the 6th of April 2021, we will see uh, a switch in the responsibility for determining a contractor's status and if appropriate, operating PAYE and national insurance contributions. Um, and, and that switch switches the responsibility from the personal service company or the other intermediary to the end user business. So what do you need to do? I think firstly, you're going to need to consider if you are caught. Uh, the rules are shifting for, as I said before, medium and large organisations in the private sector. If you are small, uh, then you're going to be exempt from the new rules and things carry on as they have up to now. The test for assessing small uh, is linked to a number of different factors. Um, it includes looking at things like turnover, numbers of employees and balance sheet total and also whether you're part of a larger corporate group. And uh, I've given you a link in the slides there to uh, the guidance on whether you are small or not, uh, so that you can take a look at that. Uh, the next thing is to identify any contractors you uh, contract with supplying services via an intermediary. Um, I should just flag that the changes won't affect anybody who supplies their services to you directly without using an intermediary. So, for example, in the situation I explained before, if Anne, uh, if Anne Jones doesn't have her own company, she just contracts with you as herself, um, then these rules won't apply. Um, think about how, who's responsible for assessing status, for, for, for looking at these relationships and assessing whether you've got something that looks like disguised employment, and how do you make that determination? Um, it, the end user, so your business, will, will need to provide the status determination statement to a contractor before you make your payments to that contractor. And if there's an agency in the chain, then you need to provide your status determination statement to the agency as well. So how do you look at that relationship and how do you make that assessment? Uh, you must assess with reasonable care what the contractor status for tax purposes would have been if they'd been engaged directly. And that's a multi-factor assessment, looking at a whole range of factors and drilling into the nature of that relationship. Looking at control and working arrangements, how much control does the end user have over the contractor's hours, place of work, can the end user direct how the work is done or does the contractor have quite a lot of discretion on how to do their tasks? The greater the control, the more it looks like disguised employment. Integration into the business, how integrated are they into your business and its management? How would they introduce themselves to customers? Would they introduce themselves as working for you or working for themselves? Mutuality of obligation. Uh, is there a binding commitment on the contractor to accept any work you offer them or is there a binding commitment on you to actually offer them an amount of work? Uh, the stronger the mutuality of obligation, the more that looks like um, disguised employment. And substitution, can the contractor send somebody else if they can't do the job on a given day? Have they ever done that? Um, could you reject the substitute? An unfettered right to appoint a substitute is a, a strong indicator of genuine self-employment. So the whole range of factors, those and others. Um, HMRC have a, a good uh, tool called the um, Check Employment Status for Tax tool, shortened to CEST, given you the link to that and that's a very good starting point. Um, it asks a load of questions, you punch in the answers and it gives you an assessment. Um, and the good thing about that is if you enter the correct information honestly and uh, you keep it up to date, then HMRC will stand by that outcome of the CEST tool. Um, the downside to it is that it is fairly uh, well recognised that in some cases the CEST tool won't give an answer. And so uh, you'll need to uh, look into other options. There are other services out there and some insurance backed services too. Um, so you'll need to have a think about what you're going to do in those situations. 
um, I think as well, um, what you need to think about is that um, you need to make sure you've got a process for confirming your assessments and you need to think about having a process if somebody challenges their determination. Um, there must be a dispute resolution procedure where somebody has the right to challenge that determination and you respond in writing within 45 days. And I also think uh, you need to review your contracts with intermediaries. Uh, do your contracts allow you to operate POE and NICs if you determine that the individuals are caught? Uh, and look at your payment timeframes. Does that give you enough time and enough space to operate payroll? And also revisiting your tax indemnity provision. Are your IT and payment systems set up? liaise with accounts um, and communicate with your accounts teams to make sure that you have the ability to uh, operate the payments correctly. That's all I wanted to say about IR35. I'm now just going to flip to uh, some of the other things that we have on the horizon. Um, so firstly, uh, minimum wage increases. Um, from the 6th of April, 2021, we'll see increases to the national uh, living wage and minimum wage rates. The national living wage, uh, which currently applies only to workers aged 25 and over, will increase by 2.2% to £8.91. Um, and that is also being extended to 23 and 24 year olds for the first time. Uh, for younger workers, we'll see smaller increases, but the apprentice rate is a 3.6% increase to £4.15 per hour. So have those on your radar. You'll see the next point on my slide is consultation on the reform of non-compete clauses. Uh, this is uh, an interesting one. Um, government has recently launched consultation on non-compete clauses. And by that, I mean clauses in employment contracts that specify that um, an individual uh, who leaves employment can't work for a competitor for a given period, it's often six months, but it can be uh, longer or shorter than that, depending on the circumstances, um, uh, that, that for a certain period, somebody can't work for a competitor. And the consultation indicates that the government is looking, taking a, a hard look at those provisions and options include whether they should just be banned altogether or should only be enforceable if the former employer pays the restrained employee uh, for the duration of the covenant. And that would be a, a significant change to UK law, although that latter approach is the approach taken in quite a number of other countries. I don't think we would see any changes happen very quickly, but do have this on your radar and if you are a business that um, you know relies heavily on those sorts of clauses to protect your business interests it's uh, important to know that there's some discussion around this at the moment. Uh, another thing is uh, consultation on a ban on exclusivity clauses. Exclusivity clauses are clauses that say whilst you are employed by us you cannot work elsewhere and there's some consultation going on also that closes on the uh, 26th of February around restricting um, the use of those clauses for low paid staff. But the idea being that um, it, it's not fair uh, for low paid staff to not be able to uh, supplement their income elsewhere. I also want to talk about the employment bill. Um, the employment bill is um, a piece of uh, legislation um, that was originally announced in the Queen's speech in December 2019, um, but was delayed due to COVID-19. Um, and that bill is likely to introduce and or at least pave the way for a number of new things. Uh, we've got a potential extension of redundancy protection to pregnant employees and maternity returners. Uh, there's a common myth that you can't make anyone who is on maternity leave redundant. That's not the case. Um, you can't select somebody for redundancy because they are on maternity leave. That would be discriminatory and unlawful. Um, but you, if they are selected as a result of a fair selection process, uh, then you can select somebody on maternity leave for redundancy. Um, and currently, though, uh, such individuals have priority um, to be allocated to alternative roles if there are alternative roles available. So they ha uh, ha have the right to be uh, allocated to a new post 
ahead of anybody who's not on maternity leave. Um, the Employment Bill uh, will introduce provisions to extend that protection beyond just the period of maternity leave to uh, from the moment the employee informs their employer that they are um, pregnant to six months after they return from maternity leave. So there's uh, talk about some extension to that. Uh, we don't know exactly when that will come into force, but it's certainly in the pipeline. There is also uh, some changes in relation to making flexible working the default. Um, at the moment, uh, obviously the standard working arrangements are, are the standard, but people have the right to request flexible working in certain circumstances. There is some change in the pipeline in relation to that. That's an interesting one because obviously uh, working practices have been totally thrown upside down in relation to the pandemic and flexible working has kind of become more the default um, anyway, but uh, there is due to be some legislative change in that field too. There's also a new right to neonatal leave and pay in the pipeline, a new right for up to 12 weeks um, pay leave for parents whose babies spend time in neonatal uh, care units. That is probably due in 2023. Um, and we're also due to see um, a week's leave for unpaid carers. The bill recognises that many people have caring responsibilities and a right to take up, up to an extra five days unpaid leave to carry out caring responsibilities. And then I've just flagged uh, rights to request a more stable contract. That's for gig or um, casual workers um, once they've been engaged on some sort of casual contract for 26 weeks, the right to be able to request a more stable contract of employment. And there is also in the pipeline um, the establishment of a single enforcement agency um, with responsibility for state enforcement of employment law to protect vulnerable workers. Um, whilst the bill um, may have the provisions for setting up that agency, I think it will be some years before it's actually um, up and running. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. I apologise that it's a bit of a whistle to stop tour through some things, um, but hopefully that's given you uh, an overview of some of the things that you need to have on your radar. Uh, you've got a picture of the team up there and um, yeah, my email address is just at the bottom of that last slide, nicola at juliantaylorhr.com. So if anybody wants to drop me a line or if you'd like a copy of the slides, I'd be really happy to, uh, to send that out. Thank you.